Hi guys, welcome back to 30 Days to Your First Website Design, a Touch Plus Premium course. I'm Ian Yates and today we're going to talk about browsers. We'll begin as always by taking a quick look at what we're going to cover in this video. We'll firstly take a look at some browser examples and then we're going to explore something called graceful degradation. Then another something known as progressive enhancement and after having discussed all that we'll have a look at our own CSS in relation to various browsers. Lastly, as always, I'll give you some further reading plus an assignment. Now, as a web designer, you're aiming to have your work experienced by the global masses and more often than not, via a web browser. There are several browsers around and it's nothing to do with you which of these browsers are used to view your sites. So it's therefore advisable to bear each one in mind when building your projects. The most significant browsers are those you see here, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Opera, Internet Explorer and Apple Safari. And if we take a look at the figures provided by W3Schools, if I just open up my browser here, drag that so you can actually see what I'm talking about, uh, we can get a good idea of the proportion of internet activity which finds its way through each one. Now, implementing your own analytics will give you a more accurate picture of the browsers used to view your own sites. But we can see here that most web pages are viewed with uh, Firefox, then Chrome, uh, then Internet Explorer, uh, and Safari and Opera, as you can see, hold a relatively small portion of the market. And we can explore these figures further and examine the proportion each version of each browser holds. Let's take a look at Internet Explorer, for example. And we can see that currently, uh, most Internet Explorer users have version 8 running. There we go. Uh, a smaller but growing number uh, have uh, version 9 uh, installed, and some folk still have versions 7 and even 6 running. Now, why is this relevant? Well, unfortunately, browsers behave differently where your markup and styling is concerned. Some older versions may not understand the CSS rules you're using. Then again, they may well understand them, but deal with them differently to other browsers. This means that your design can look very different from one browser to the next. Now, there are a few approaches to dealing with this harsh reality. Firstly, you could ignore older browsers. Let's jump back into the presentation here for a second. Uh, and make sure your design works in more modern versions. Many people these days ignore Internet Explorer 6 as it's very outdated and can cause web designers a lot of costly extra work. The risk, of course, is that by shunning some browser users, you're alienating part of your audience. Secondly, you could employ what's known as graceful degradation. Build your designs so that they're optimized for modern browsers, making use of the latest web techniques but ensuring that older browsers can still make perfectly good use of the site. Perhaps a user has images in their browser disabled. Now adding a description of your image in the alt attribute will ensure that they at least know what should be there. Thirdly, there's the progressive enhancement approach, which is similar in ways to the graceful degradation which we just spoke about. But in this case, a site is designed according to the capabilities of the lowest common denominator. Perhaps we would aim for a site to prefer, perform perfectly from IE7 onwards. We could then progressively enhance our design for more modern browsers according to what they're capable of. We may, for example, apply CSS3 gradients to backgrounds for Chrome in which in, uh, IE7 appear as flat colors. Users who have more modern browsers enjoy a richer experience. Lastly, we could work our socks off to make sure that our site appears and behaves as near to identically as possible in all browsers. Whichever option you favour is down to your own discretion. Now let's take a look at our own project. If I just get rid of this window here. Uh, we can take into account uh, some of the theories we've just spoken about. So I'm going to open up uh, Coda once again. Uh, we, If I remind us of what we needed to be doing here in Photoshop, we were about to approach the footer area uh, of our design. Uh, now these links here, our social links, they are particularly interesting in this current situation uh, as you'll see. So let's firstly continue with a little bit of styling. If we examine what it currently looks like in the browser, uh, we'll see that uh, there's significant styling missing in the footer. So if we go 
straight into our CSS and add a section at the bottom here called footer we can start to add some styles. Now our footer itself could do with some padding because it looked a little bit cramped there so we'll add 20 pixels to the top and then slightly more at the bottom and that should already significantly improve the spacing in our footer there. Okay. Now I'm just going to copy and paste some of the styling for the uh, copyright statement there. And there we have the copyright. It was a paragraph which I've given a font size of 12, a different color, and I've floated it left. There were a couple of links in there whose color I've also changed. Let's just take a quick look at that. And there you can see them there uh, floated to the left. Okay, so that's good. Now we really need to look at our uh, links uh, over here. So we're aiming now uh, for the more capable browsers, uh, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, I'm just going to punch in a couple of styles such as this. There we go. Now the social was our that was our unordered list, and our list items are going to float right and have a little bit of a margin on each of them. Uh, so next all we need to do is cater for the anchors within those link items. Uh, list items, sorry. Uh, now each one, according to our design, has a width of 40 pixels and also a height equal to that. And we'll need to display them as block level elements in order to get them to inherit that. Uh, we are going to remove the text by indenting it way beyond the boundaries of the um, element itself. So that's uh, that. So let's take a quick look at what we've done there. And they have of course vanished to the naked eye. They are there, you can see the hover uh, taking effect there. Uh, because we now need to cater for the background on each one. Now according to our markup, uh, we had each list item with its own class to identify it there. A Skype, a Twitter and a Facebook. Uh, so we're going to add those now. If we go back and check our... Uh, sorry, where's Photoshop? If we go back and check our sprite PSD, we'll see that we uh, allowed a, a few options here. We're going to go for this third option here, the transparent background, uh, and just stick this little transparent icon on each one. Now that means we're going to have to specify a background color as well, uh, but that's no problem. So I'll just grab these and just quickly paste them in. And you can see here we have each list item and the anchor within it. And uh, we've assigned a background of the sprite ping and uh, we've positioned that according to uh, where those icons are. Uh, we've also then determined that they will have our default green as a background color. So if we just take a look at that, uh, you can see there they are. Now they need a hover state as well which we'd already uh, determined in our PSD which was that lighter green. Now you can see here I haven't changed the actual uh, background image I'm determining simply the color of the background. So if I refresh that we now have a nice neat hover effect. Uh, now in order to achieve the circle look we're going to just add some border radius to this. Uh, so we go into our A element here and you can see we've used the CSS3 border radius rule there which is exactly 20 pixels uh, which will put a nice curve on each of the four corners uh, of our link. Uh, and I've used here the WebKit and the Mozilla prefixes here uh, just for older versions of Chrome and Firefox and Safari. Uh, so if I just refresh that in my Chrome browser you'll see that it perfectly makes the circles which we had built in our PSD. Uh, now the advantage to using background colors there means that we're much more flexible with our colors themselves. Uh, but it also gives us a little bit more flexibility with modern effects such as uh, transitions. 
Now I'm just going to demonstrate that using uh, a WebKit transition uh, in because we're testing in Chrome here. So that's saved. I'm just transitioning the background uh, change that we've defined uh, in the color there. So if I refresh the page, you'll see that that hover effect now becomes much more subtle. And that would be very difficult to achieve uh, with our sprite image if we'd relied purely on these images. Uh, now that's because transitioning this background image from one to the other would result in a scrolling effect as we move between the two states. Um, now it does mean, however, that older browsers are kind of missing out on this. And if I just show you the result on the online version, if I open up Adobe Browser Lab, well, we'll discuss browser testing in further video. Uh, you can see I've taken a screenshot here. Now IE7 is struggling a little bit with our design at the moment. There are a couple of problems with it, but crucially, our links uh, remain square, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Now, this is an example, if you like, of graceful degradation. We've catered for the more modern browser. Uh, it looks exactly as we wanted it to, uh, and they are present in older browsers. They look different but at least the functionality uh, remains present. We can still use these links exactly as we would in our modern browser. We just miss out on a little of the aesthetic pleasure that's brought to us by CSS3 rules here. Uh, so we really could do with, uh, well, we need to make the decision. We can either leave it like this or we can apply some kind of fallback in order to bring IE7 up to scratch. And uh, if you recall our sprite sheet here, we did actually provide these uh, images in order to use them, so we could use them uh, right now. Uh, now, in order to take advantage, uh, we don't want to add too much uh, to our CSS file. We want to use uh, all this modern stuff that we've put in our CSS file for the modern browsers. So we need to separate things a little bit, which means that we're going to go back into our index HTML. And we're going to add a conditional comment just underneath here, which basically says, and this is legible by Internet Explorer only, uh, it says if this is less than Internet Explorer version 9, uh, then I want you to load up this CSS file here. Uh, so this is ignored by all browsers other than those uh, Internet Explorer 8, 7, uh, and 6, and beyond even. Uh, but we're not going to worry too much about those. Uh, so now we need to make ourselves an extra CSS file which can be used in this event. So we'll save that. Uh, we'll then uh, make a new file encoder here called IE CSS. And now it's in this CSS file we're going to place some of our rules uh, in order to improve the situation which we've just seen is experienced by IE7. So I'm going to quickly grab this uh, and paste it in just to keep things moving quickly. And I'll begin the CSS file with a with another little declaration here of what's going on so that that's for our own personal reference. Uh, now we have two sets of uh, three rules here. Uh, we've basically um, stating that the background is in fact still the ping, the PNG, our sprite, uh, but we've changed the coordinates for uh, in order to uh, place these three images here as our backgrounds. We've specified that it's, that it's transparent, the background color is going to be transparent uh, because we previously specified that the background color of our links uh, would be uh, this green color. Uh, so we need to remove that, otherwise we're still going to be presented with these square colors here. Uh, so we're looking at transparent links with the background of our circular buttons. Uh, we then also have a hover state for each of those, and that is, of course, dealing with these three images here. So if I save that, uh, I'm going to publish all those files we've done uh, so far to the net in order that we can actually just quickly test those in Browser Lab. So they're uploading as we speak. I'm taking a frustrating amount of time. 
Oh, off you go. There we go. Uh, and I'll move back into browser lab and I'm going to refresh uh, IE7, which should now uh, be taking into account all of these additional rules here. Like so. There we go. 100%. Okay. And there we go. Uh, now, still some problems, as I've discussed. We'll have to deal with those in a later video. But um, crucially, you can see here it's making good use of our sprite and it is overruling the slightly nicer effects that we applied to more modern browsers. Okay, it's time for some further reading as usual. Uh, so let's just jump back into the presentation. Uh, I have two articles worth reading for you, both of which I've quoted in this video. Uh, the first is a classic from 2002 by Peter Paul Koch. He describes the concepts behind graceful degradation. Uh, secondly, for great summary of the ideas behind progressive enhancement, try this article on a list apart by Aaron Gustafson. Now before we jump into the next video, I'd like you to decide for yourself which approach makes most sense to your design. Remember to consider your audience. It's the users who you're catering for, after all. I'd also like you to take a look at our CSS and update what you've done if you're following along. Next time on 30 days to your first website design, we're going to move on to the next level in the standards model, behavior. We're going to get our slideshow up and running. I'm Ian Yates, and from all of us here at Tuts Plus, thanks for watching.